Right, well, it's time for our first viewer suggested topic, taking a look at how Peter Parker got his powers. But luckily, this time as we're looking at Spider-Man, I won't have to spend hours looking for footage of spiders. Instead, I'm going to be spending hours looking at viral genetics and the human genome. Hello everybody and welcome once again to the Science of Spider-Man, where today, rather than looking at if Peter Parker's powers are similar to that of a spider, like we did a month ago, we'll be looking at how he got those powers and the genetics that could possibly lead to you having your own wall crawling abilities. Now, you might remember from the last Spider-Man video we did that Peter's powers caused by the spider bites were his super strength, balance and his wall crawling ability. The request for this topic said, can you make another Spider-Man video about retroviruses and how Spider-Man could theoretically be possible with a retrovirus? The first thing we need to clarify is that even if you were to be bitten by a spider and somehow it were to alter your DNA in any way, to get spider sense, super strength and wall climbing, you need multiple bites to change your DNA in multiple places in order for the relevant genes to be expressed. There are two distinct types of spider that have been shown biting Peter and giving him spider powers. Genetically engineered spiders as seen in Sony's Amazing Spider-Man movies and the much more common radioactive spider seen in pretty much all other Spider-Man adaptations. We'll be looking at both of these types just to be thorough and seeing how they could possibly change Peter's DNA. So let's start off looking at how a radioactive spider might have changed Peter Parker's DNA. This is by far the most popular interpretation of how Spider-Man got his powers, appearing in all but three animated Spider-Man adaptations. When we think of this radioactivity, we're talking about ionizing radiation like gamma waves or x-rays. These can impact DNA in three main ways. First of all, it can change the chemical structure of a DNA base. As well as this, it can also break the sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA, or break the hydrogen bonds connecting the DNA base pairs. This radiation therefore can cause damage to the DNA and cause it to mutate. But keep in mind that those mutations are unlikely to result in a new gene which will be the exact same as a spider's DNA. And even if it was, there's no way to tell if that gene would be expressed or not. The worst case scenario for this is that the radiation would cause a DNA lesion, which damages the chemical structure of the DNA causing a double strand breakage. This, if not noticed by a cell cycle checkpoint during cell division, could result in the host developing cancer in the place where the bite occurred. So this idea seems to have been squashed before it's even started. But let's say that the virus existed in the spider's venom to transfer the DNA. Would it be possible for any kind of virus to take the DNA presence from its initial host and transfer it to a new host? Well in order to answer this, we need to establish how viruses infect humans and what the difference is between a retrovirus and a regular virus. The first thing that we need to clarify for the genetically engineered spider is that spider's venom consists mainly of globular proteins. And as such, in order for genetic information to be transferred, a viral parasite containing all of the spider's genes necessary for these proteins would be needed for those powers to be expressed on a genetic level. So viruses are tiny, like really, really, really tiny. They're normally between 20 and 300 nanometers in diameter. That's over 10 times smaller than the smallest bacteria, Pelagibacter ubique. These viruses can infect pretty much all forms of life, from bacteria to protists, and there are four classifications of viruses in nature. The first viruses we'll look at are the helical viruses such as the tobacco mosaic virus. These consist of spiraling nucleic acids surrounded by a hollow cylinder of protein molecules called a caspamere, which protects the virus's genetic information. Following these we have polyhedral viruses such as adenovirus. These viruses have their genetic information floating in a polyhedral caspamere. Following polyhedral viruses we then have spherical viruses which include most coronaviruses. These have a core made up of genetic information like the others and this is once again surrounded by a polyhedral caspid. Enclosing this caspid is a phospholipid bilayer, like those found in most cell membranes, and this is coated in many surface proteins and glycoproteins which are used for recognition by the cells it tries to infect. And finally, we have complex viruses such as the bacteriophage virus. 
These are possibly one of the weirdest looking microbes, almost like something out of the War of the Worlds. These have neither helical or polyhedral forms. Their RNA is contained within a protective caspid or head. This head will sometimes have many different proteins attached to it. First of all, a helical tail with long tail fibres which are involved in initial cell receptor binding. On the end of the tail, there's also a complex base plate. This is involved in the virus's infection mechanisms. It binds to a cell's membrane and causes the tail tube to be driven into the host cell membrane. Of course, a virus can't replicate by itself. In order for a virus to replicate, it must infect a living cell. This is due to viruses only having genetic material and no cellular structure. It can replicate and evolve, but it requires a host cell to do so. The viral life cycle takes place in six distinct stages. Let's take a look at the influenza virus and see how it replicates. Influenza targets columnar epithelial cells of the respiratory tract. The first step in the infection of these cells by the virus is for the virus to enter the cell. Influenza is an enveloped virus with three types of integral membrane proteins. These are hemagglutinin, neuraminidase and M2. During receptor mediated endocytosis, the influenza virus binds to receptors containing the sialic acid N-acetyl-90-acetyl-neuraminic acid. Following this, the cell engulfs the virus by endocytosis. The virus is swallowed by an endosome, which brings the virus directly into the cell, bypassing the cell's plasma membrane. But the virus can also bind to the cell's membrane and undergo fusion. In this process, the virus initially sticks to the cell membrane. It then moves along the surface of the cell until its viral fusion proteins come into contact with a corresponding receptor module on the cell's membrane. If binding occurs, then the two membranes would remain distinct. The fusion doesn't happen spontaneously. This occurs in two major steps. The first is that the two monolayers merge in a process called hemofusion, forming one big phospholipid bilayer which is known as the hemifusion diaphragm. This keeps the viral genome from entering the cytosol until the second step. In the second step, the fusion proteins disrupt the single bilayer to create a pore which produces an aqueous pathway between the virus and the host cell. This pore allows the viral genome to enter the cell to begin infection. After the virus enters the cell by either method, it undergoes uncoating and its viral contents are released. If the virus contains either single-stranded or double-stranded DNA, they will need to enter the cell's nucleus in order to replicate and be transcribed into viral RNA for protein synthesis. These viruses can only be replicated if the cell is in the S phase of mitosis, and as such, some of these DNA viruses can manipulate the cell cycle checkpoints, later causing cancer. Not exactly the superpowers we were hoping for, but what about retroviruses? How do these differ from regular viruses and can they offer us the powers we want? Retroviruses such as the human immunodeficiency virus are enveloped viruses which have a core protein which contains the RNA genome as well as three enzymes, reverse transcriptase, integrase and protease. In retroviral replication, the single-stranded RNA undergoes reverse transcription to form single-stranded DNA. This DNA is then replicated using DNA polymerase to produce the viral double-stranded DNA genome. This retroviral genome contains a few distinct regions. First of all is the promoter region. This is a region of DNA which initiates the transcription of genes and controls the binding of the RNA polymerase enzyme to the DNA strands. The gag region which encodes for the viral caspid. The pole region which encodes for the reverse transcriptase, integrase and protease enzymes. And the NV region which encodes for the protective lipid which surrounds the virus. Surrounding these genes are two sets of long terminal repeats. These mediate the integration of the retroviral DNA into the host genome. In order to produce more retroviral particles, the retroviral DNA is expressed by the host cell's RNA polymerase, which forms virus-related RNA. These strands are then used as templates to produce the proteins needed to form a new protein envelope, as well as the enzymes which all come together to form a new retroviral particle. 
It's worth noting that when replicated, only the retroviral DNA is copied over. So, what if the virus simply contained all the genes needed to give Peter Parker these powers? Would it be possible for a retrovirus to contain all of the spider's genes necessary for all of the spider's powers to get expressed? Well, to answer this, let's look at how big a spider's genome is compared to a viral genome. The world's largest virus is known as a megavirus. It's 680 nanometers wide and contains 1.3 million base pairs of DNA or 1.3 megabases. The common household spider's whole genome is made up of 1,443.9 megabases of DNA. When you consider the fact that multiple genes would be needed to code for the powers that we would want, it makes it far harder to establish how many megabases would be needed. For example, it takes 11 genes to code for human hair colour alone, ignoring the genes that would be needed for its growth, which in humans is the LHX2 gene on chromosome 9. Even if you are somehow able to have a retrovirus large enough to contain all of the genes necessary, the placements of those genes in the genome would be completely random. The retroviral DNA move along DNA like a nut and bolt, rotating around a DNA looking for a suitable integration site. So at the very least, you'd need multiple retroviruses to target the chromosomes and genes needed in order for the genes to be expressed as required for spider powers. So as it turns out, whether radioactive or genetically engineered, it's better to avoid being bitten by any spiders. You're more than likely not going to get superpowers. Instead, you'll just end up feeling pretty crap depending on the spiders. This is due to multiple factors. Radiation causing significantly more harm than any kind of superpower, surprising I know. Retroviruses not being able to transfer spider DNA between species and viruses simply just not being large enough to contain all of the genes that would be needed to give you the genetic information needed for superpowers. And even if the virus contained all that information, it doesn't guarantee it would be expressed on a genetic level. Thanks for watching. Just a bit of an update or whatever, these videos will continue being twice a month as I'm going into my master's degree, so time might be a bit tight for research and editing. Might be able to do three a month, but I'll have to see how it goes. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, then don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you have any particular scientific subject or game that you'd like to see me cover in the future, then please tell me in the comments down below. But until then, this has been the Science of Spider-Man again, and I'll see you next time.